Hello everyone, I am Linda Rezevi. I am here today at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at FAU Jupiter with Dr. Stephen Macknick, who's joining us uh, from Downstate Health Sciences University here today uh, to present as part of Brainy Days 2020. It's a celebration of neuroscience throughout the month of March. Thanks so much for coming. Oh, well, thank you for having me. And you know, <clears throat> we all get very interested into optical illusions and magic and how does it all work? And that's something that you're gonna be speaking on today. Uh, you have a lecture called Champions of Illusion, Brain Science Insights into Magical Trickery. And so that title really is a doozy in trying <laughs> to figure out, okay, what, what am I expecting today? So talk to us about your research and what to expect. Right, so today I'm gonna to talk about illusions and what, what are they, right? So they're, they're where the the perception that we have doesn't match the physical reality or the expectation of that reality. And what does that really mean in kind of the deep sense and kind of how do you know you're looking at an illusion or not? Now, the what people don't really realize is that most of their vision is actually illusory and that the real question that we're asking is in this science is what isn't an illusion? what is real that we're actually bringing into our eyes and seeing for real. Now, I know that's hard for people to grasp because it seems like everything around us is so real right. and consistent. But the fact of the matter is, if you think about it, your vision comes into your eye and it goes through your optic nerves of your eye into your brain. Well, your optic nerves is, uh, each optic nerve is about a million pixels. And when I was a grad student, I thought, well, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot, right? But now we each have in our pocket um, one of these devices, right. right? With a 12 megapixel camera in there. That's 12 times more pixels than what our, eye than what our optic nerve has. Right. And it still takes not great pictures right, <laughs> compared to our vision. Right? Yeah. So our, our brain is doing something with a very tiny little bit of information. Right. And it's doing something extraordinary, building this entire universe around us where everything looks really great. Do you, is it that our mind is actually changing what we're seeing or is it the magic that is making us see something different? Well, so, so far I've only been talking about visual illusions. Right. Okay. And yes, our mind is creating almost everything we see. So, so if you think of it this way, if you, if I hold up my arm, my thumb at arm's length, go ahead and try it mm -hmm. and put, look at your thumbnail. So when you're looking at your thumbnail right now, mm -hmm. that's about one square degree of visual angle. What that means is right. if you had 360 degrees thumbs, it would make a circle around your head, right. right? Because each one of them is one degree. Now, if you think about how many square degrees are in your entire visual field, it's about 1,200, okay. okay? So that means your thumbnail is about 0.1%. It's one one thousandth or, th or so of your entire visual field, right. okay? So, but when you're looking at your thumbnail at arm's length, that's the size of the visual field that you can see 2020 perfect vision and everywhere else you're legally blind. That's the only place you can see with 2020 vision or ever have, okay? Mm -hmm. So that means when you walked into this room, you made eye movements around, yeah. okay? And from those eye movements, you saw a tiny little 0.1% of the visual scene, and you're only making one to three eye movements a second. So when you walk from that door over there to these chairs and say, what, three seconds? Mm -hmm. You made three to nine eye movements. So you for sure saw less than 1% of this room by the time you got here. And your brain took that tiny bit of information mm -hmm. and built this incredible simulation of this room in your mind that you could interact with, you didn't fall down, you didn't trip over the coffee table over there, and you could get to the chair and sit down and successfully and navigate this world that is 99 plus percent visual garbage <laughs> that your brain made up for you. That's the mystery of vision science that we're very interested in the neuroscientists. So now it's not too surprising that illusions exist, right? When you think of it this way, right? Because illusions are where that is not, it's apparent that the physical reality doesn't match our perception. What's, what's uh, interesting to me is why isn't it always that way. <laughs> like that? It's almost miraculous that we ever see anything correctly and accurately. How does that happen mm -hmm. is very interesting. Magic now, is where you take those visual illusions, and part of magic can be visual illusions themselves, right. but imagine now those same processes that are developing the world around us uh, from tiny bits of information, but now instead of visual, they're cognitive. 
-hmm. right? So they have to do with causal inference, which came first, A versus B, right? right? So magicians can play with that. What about memory? They can create false memory so that you remember how a trick happened in the wrong way so you can't recreate it correctly. There can be different kinds of cognitive tricks that they manipulate uh, having to do with how you attend to verse some places versus the other in a process we call misdirection. So these types of things now are the illusions of cognition that magicians uh, play, play a role in and the same brain circuits that have to do with visual illusions mm -hmm. almost certainly play a role in those cognitive effects as well. We don't really know that much about it yet, so that's exactly why we're researching these things, is to find out if we can get a grasp of what it means to be conscious, what it means to have a simulation of the world around us in our minds, which is what most people call consciousness, right? right? And, how to, and, and how we live in there, right? It's not that the world outside doesn't exist, it does, yeah. but we have very little data about that, mm -hmm. and you've never lived there, right? <laughs> you've only ever lived inside your mind, right. And so understanding how that mind is created, that conscious perception of the world is created, is really understanding the fundamental nature of the universe, just like a high energy physicist does. But, but it's the universe we actually exist in. What do you think it, it would tell? You know, what are you hoping to find uh, by solving this mystery of the mind? No, I, basically I'm in it for, for per, purely selfish motives. I wanna know what I am and why I'm here and uh, what my world around me is. Uh, fundamentally, that's what drives me. But, um, you know, I think it has a lot of applied uh, uh, uses. So, yeah, obviously it has a role in understanding consciousness in potentially vegetative state or in locked-in syndrome, or it can have aspects of understanding prosthetic vision, which is an interest of mine. Mm -hmm. It can have um, all sorts of useful uh, purposes just like you know if you wear glasses like me yeah. and that corrects the vision the light coming into your eyes is now bent correctly so it's focused correctly on your retina mm -hmm. I mean it could be possible that we if we really understood what the brain was doing we could have other types of assistive devices to help us see better and understand the world better around us as well and do you think people see things differently uh, just like the the dress, for instance, is yeah. it blue? Is it white? Is it gold? What color is the the infamous yes. dress? <laughs> the more the more we study the dress, the more we understand that that and illusions like that, which are these uh, ambiguous color illusions, um, are which are very interesting. We we could make color illusions before the yeah. dress came, right. where I could show you something that under white light might look orange, but I could make it look blue to you in certain circumstances. So it would mm -hmm. look, wow, that was really neat. But everybody sees it blue. Right. Before the dress, everybody saw it blue. Right. What was interesting about the dress is you look at this dress and some people think it's black and blue and some people think it's white and gold. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at the same image under the same lighting conditions, right? So mm -hmm. something's different about the people rather right. than the... And the more we learn about it, the more we know that there's uh, deep contributions to our prior knowledge about the world that affects the way we see the world. So the people who are seeing the dress as black and blue are imagining the picture in the dress that the dress is under sunlight. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the people who see it in white and gold, like me, mm -hmm. I'm a white and gold person, yeah. are imagining that the dress is being seen in the shade mm. under the blue light of the, of, the, of the sun. So our brains are doing uh, creating the colors of those things in that mind's eye consciousness model of the world mm -hmm. based on what they think the light source is and where it is right. and what color it is. So our brain's making these assumptions. It's already. basically trying to figure out what that material is made out of and what color it is and what right. the surface properties are based on the lighting situation. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can't see the lighting mm -hmm. in the picture, you have right. to uh, you have to uh, kind of in, uh, deduce it. Okay, and so the people are basically, some of them think it's sunlight and some of them think it's a shade and that's why, mm -hmm. since those are different colors, that yeah. you see the dress a different color. And you provided us some other examples to kind of show how our brain can register something a little bit different. I believe right. we have a chess piece um, image here. Talk to us about this and what are we seeing? Right, so this illusion is from Bart Anderson and Jonathan Winower, who were at MIT at the time. 
And uh, this illusion is really cool because the chest pieces on top look white mm -hmm. and the chest pieces on the bottom look black, but that's actually false. The difference between them is false. In fact, the pieces on the top and the pieces on the bottom are physically identical to each other and they only look white on the top and black on the bottom because the backgrounds are different. Mm -hmm. And so based on the assumption about the backgrounds and the atmospheric effects around the chest pieces, our brain is telling us they're white versus black based on this. But if you tried to play chess with these pieces, it'd be problematic because they're all exactly the same color. <laughs> <laughs> and we have another example with a, uh, uh, an image of a dog. Right. So here you have two dogs, right? The blue one is on the top right and the yellow one is on the bottom left. But it's similarly, this shows that the same kind of contrast effects can happen in the color domain because these dogs are physically identical. If you took every pixel of the dog's ear on the, uh, the, on the blue dog in the upper right and you went to the dog's ear of the yellow one in the bottom left, every single pixel would be physically the same color if you used a light meter to, to measure them. It's unreal. And it's only <laughs> different in our minds and, uh, and we're seeing it that way because our brain takes into context what it thinks the lighting is mm -hmm. and because of that background, our brain is making certain assumptions about the lighting and the contrast of the background. Wow. I mean, just to try to figure it out, <laughs> but as you're explaining it, it makes sense, but when you're looking at it, you're like, there's no way. There, you know, we even had an office argument about the chest pieces. They were definitely different colors. Oh, print them out. Some. <laughs> print them out, get a pair of scissors, and, and, this <laughs> and is, prove it to yourself. This is part, you actually started uh, the Champions of Illusion. Talk to us about that contest that you started, that you thought was gonna be a one and done, and has become something much more. That's right. So. Uh, my, my collaborator, Susana Martinez Conde, and I uh, ran a, a, a conference in 2005 in Spain. Uh, and Susana had the great idea that we should bring the public into the, con uh, the conference, because in a vision conference, there's lots of illusions and things like that, and the and public's interested in it. Right. And we should be doing more to communicate to the public with our science. So she had the idea, why don't we have a contest? Yeah. And it'd be open to everybody in the world, and, okay. and people would come and present their illusions. And what happened was, we thought people would come, and the vision scientists especially would have illusions that they might have been thinking about for a long time sitting on a shelf, and they were gonna come, and they'd use them, right. and that would be it. Yeah. But that's not what happened. So what happened was, <laughs> we had a, the contest went really well, people asked us to do it again, we figured, okay, well, we'll see what happened next year. Mm -hmm. And it just get getting stronger and stronger. So mm -hmm. rather than people having old stuff on their shelf that they were just pulling out for the contest, which I think happened in the first few years, right. It also garnered so much interest that people started, and especially people in the public, started wow. seeing these things for themselves and started submitting their own um, items. And every year, they're, they're competing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the scientists, graphic artists and computer scientists and other people who like see these types of things all the time and think about them mm -hmm. are actually about half of our contestants that make it to the top ten. And um, uh, yeah, so it's just kind of this self-perpetuating thing. The more exciting it gets for people the more people discover these things and I've come to realize there it's not true that we now understand most of the illusions and, and we're just gonna run out soon it's right. just we we haven't even plucked the low-hanging fruit yet yeah. you know if you can still discover things like the dress just a couple of years ago mm -hmm. that's a very basic effect yeah. that nobody would have predicted in the in the visual sciences yeah. it's a huge effect it's massive mm -hmm. and it just it came out of Twitter Right, or, <laughs> right. or Instagram. Right? right. But the point is that it's um, that kind of thing is just going to keep coming. Do you think we come across uh, many illusions in our everyday lives that we have no idea that? Yeah, that I we're think facing? I think you're dealing with mostly illusions yeah. during your in your everyday life. I mean, right now you're experiencing massive illusions. So, for example, you may not have realized that you've got several blind spots in your vision right now. Mm -hmm. That you can you if you close one eye, you see a big black spot in the center of your vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You do? Not in the center, but I see some black spots, but it might be the light that I'm staring at. <laughs> okay. So what I'm saying is about the size of this ring of lights here okay. around our camera. Right. Right. If you close your if you close one eye, okay. that ring of lights or so is the size of the blind spot very near the center of your vision. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's where if you close your left eye and you have your on your right eye to the right of your at center of your vision, that's where your optic nerve connects to your eye. There are no photoreceptors. Mm -hmm. You're blind. Okay? okay, but you don't see a big black spot when you close one eye. Right. Why? You, you're blind. 
There's no, you, you can't possibly see that. So to show that to yourself, take your arms, you make sure your elbows are straight, okay. put your thumbs together and kind of the double loser sign, right? So <laughs> now, now close your left eye mm -hmm. and with your right eye, look at your left finger. This disappears, right? You can't look right. here. You have to look right. here. Right. So Thank look so here, but pay attention over here right. and you'll see that that finger disappears, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're looking here, that finger disappears. It disappears because it's in your blind spot. But you can see what's behind it, right? So why yeah. you're, you can see. So I see her feet over there. But you, but your <laughs> finger's gone. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the finger, though, you can see what's behind it, right? right. So you have X-ray vision. <laughs> yeah. Really? Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna assert that you don't. Okay. So the, your finger is gone, but you can see what's behind your finger, right? Because your brain's filling in information from around the blind spot. Like a puzzle piece. Solving Your brain for you. is, is like saying, "Oh, you got a blind spot. I'm going to fill it in with information that should be there." Right. But that algorithm that mm -hmm. does that is not smart enough to fill in your finger. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't see a blind spot at all. You would just see your finger there. Yeah. You would model your finger in because it knows your finger's there. Your brain's putting your finger there, right? right? So the point is that we now this is the way we scient scientifically can determine these illusions happening. So the point here is that if you got one eye closed, mm -hmm. you got a huge blind spot in your vision you've never seen before. Right. It's happening all the time. There's a big illusory spot almost near the center of your vision that you've always had every moment of your life mm -hmm. that you didn't know about that your brain is using to help you actually navigate the world so that you don't see a big black spot. Okay? That's so interesting. This is the kind of thing that is playing a role in your vision all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. And a lot of this you cover in, in your book that uh, was released. So that is um, Slights of Mind, What the Neuroscience of Magic Reveals About Our Everyday Deceptions. Yeah. Talk to us about what people can expect if they pick up that book. So with Slights of Mind, we uh, talk about how um, our journey with learning magic and learning about magic from magicians and then talking, learning about how magic works in the mind in terms of the cognitive illusions and what they're doing inside the brain. And so today, uh, you have a lecture because I don't want to keep you too long because you probably want to rest up and get ready. Today at noon, you'll be giving a lecture right here at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Uh, it's free and open to the public. Give us one last pitch on uh, what people can expect for today. So we're going to talk about illusions like we have in our book, Champions of Illusion, and we're going to talk about magic like we have in our book slides of mind and we're going to talk about what those things mean for the brain and we're going to talk about how you can think about illusions and how you can structure them they're not just kind of random effects that don't mean anything yeah. they actually have very specific um, consequences for perception and cognition and so we'll talk about that today all right dr mcnick thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you all there this is all part of fau's brain institute's brainy days happening throughout the month of march again the lecture begins at noon and you can find some more information at fau.edu backslash jupiter have a great day everyone thank you very much